Hello everyone, welcome to Engineers Ireland and we are now dealing with one of my favourite little sections on numbers. It has to do with indices and thirds. It's my one of my favourites because you won't know this yet because you're still doing your junior cert but your ability to deal with indices and to be able to deal with them as clear in your mind as saying one and one is two, to be able to deal with them like that will be to ensure that you can solve a lot of problems that other people will have serious headaches with. If you learn these well now, it will stand to you big time, even for your leaving cert and when you're in college. Fundamentally, and I think we might have mentioned this before, but being, let's say, a mathematician or involved in a profession which has a lot of mathematics, such as being a physicist or an engineer, those type of things, it has parallels to almost any other type of profession or trade. For example, a, a person may be a plumber, but unless that plumber has a bag or a box of tools, the plumber's knowledge can't be applied. Us carrying out mathematics are in exactly the same boat. We carry around a toolbox with us. At the moment, the level of mathematics you're learning is Junior Cert Honours Mathematics. But there are many little tools from what you've learned before that you have to keep bringing into practice. How do you add two fractions, for example? You'll have known how to do that in National School, but it becomes very important when you're dealing with algebra and your fractions now may have x's and y's in them. But fundamentally, the principle is exactly the same. And that little principle of how to add two fractions is one of the tools you have. Now, we're going to learn tools related to indices and thirds that should stand to you all the way right up to being, let's say, getting your PhD or whatever path you choose to follow. <coughs> we will obviously start with the indices. The biggest problem I think that people find with indices, and I know people who have got doctorates, and if you say to them, what's 17 to the power of zero, they'll go and have to seriously think about it. It's something to the power of zero is the one that really catches them. Now, there is a way out of this, and it's, it's kind of a silly little way, but at the same time, I don't mind having a silly little way of doing something if it means that I don't then make a mistake. So, let's start playing down through the usual set of things. x cubed, x squared, x to the power of 1, x to the power of 0, x to the minus 1, and we'll say we have enough in that. What you will notice, and the first thing I want you to notice, is that that's a plus 3, plus 2, plus 1. And clearly, down here, that's a negative, and that's a negative. Generally, we are taught that these mean certain things. x cubed, you're taught, is x by x by x. It's x multiplied by itself three times. x squared is x multiplied by itself twice, so it's x by x. x to the 1 is a single x. And now, this is the one that causes the problem. Because all these have made sense. What's x to the 0? No x, clearly. But does that mean the answer is 0? Or what is the answer? The way out of that is to employ the silly little concept that I mentioned to you. But, like most silly little concepts in mathematics, they are extremely powerful. There are two things you can always do in mathematics. And believe it or not, even for the Leaving Cert, there are quite a number of proofs that you have that you cannot solve, at least um, in the standard methods, without doing one or the other of these. The first one is multiplied by 1. And the second one is add 0. I know it sounds stupid. But, for example, in calculus, improving the product rule, you actually ha cannot go beyond a certain point unless you add zero. 
So how do you add zero? <coughs> it's a bit like if you um, if you have if you owe five euro to somebody and you have five euro in your pocket. While you have five euro in your pocket, you have for somehow or another the use of it. But yet, if you say the overall balance of my money is five minus five euro, which is no euro, you say that's a zero condition. But the zero condition is split into a plus five minus five. So a zero is something minus itself. A one is something divided by itself so long as the thing isn't zero. Five divided by five is one. You will find as we go through this section there's a number of uh, times we will deliberately multiply in by one in order to solve problems such as removing thirds from underneath the line in a fraction. Here we will simply multiply by one. So x cubed is 1 multiplied by x three times. x squared is 1 multiplied x twice. x to the 1 is 1 multiplied by a single x. And x to the 0 is 1 not multiplied by an x. Maybe this will work for your mind. It certainly works for my mind. So it's, for me, relatively easy to remember this. And I'm asking you, from practical experience to say to learn this the same as you know one and one is two if you remember something to the power of zero is one you need to know it like this without any hesitation if you have hesitation in this you can make a mistake otherwise you can go back and look at this thing now having looked at the positive powers we're saying x squared which is x to the plus 2, is 1 multiplied by x by x. x to the plus 1 is 1 multiplied by x. So what's x to the minus 1? Well, if these plus guys produce multiplies, it should be easy enough to see that these minus ones should again deal with a 1, but now you'll divide by the x. Here, you'll have 1 divided by x squared. And just so as we're clear on it, that's 1 over x to the power of 1. And this is 1 over x squared. <coughs> so then, something to a negative power is equal to 1 divided by that thing to the positive power. If you get this concept, you will be able to work out very quickly, even if you couldn't remember it, the basic rules. However, they are worth learning off by heart. So how do the basic rules come from this? Let's go and start with the more obvious ones. If we pick as an example, and it's always, remember I've said to you, it's very good to have an example. And simple examples give you a pattern. If we look at x squared, multiplied by x cubed. We know what it means. Now at this stage I will drop the 1 because I was using it to give us this one here and also so that you can see the negative ones. So down here we'll say x squared, oh that's x by x and I'll just put a bracket around it, not that you need to, but to make it very clear to you because that's x cubed. You say, well, isn't that x by x by x by x by x. Five of them. So we're saying that x squared by x cubed is equal to x to the five. And now the simple question is how can you get five from a two power and a three power? And we can get our basic rule from this. x to some power n multiplied by x to some power n. Well, over here we found 5 is 2 plus 3. So we should find in general don't worry that this is called x to the power of n and x to the power of m. We're using n and m as a name to cover any example. 
any type of number. So x to the power of 17 multiplied by x to the power of 13 is x to the power of 17 plus 13, 30. It doesn't get easier than that. Okay, that's the multiply one. Let's now pick another simple example over here. We'll say x to the power of 5 divided by x cubed. Well, that is x by x by x by x by x, five of them, divided by x by x by x. And as we know, that x will cancel that x, that x will cancel that x, and that x will cancel that x. So we're found that it's equal to x by x, which is x squared. And now, from our simple example on the right, we can say, well, how can I get 2 from x to the power of 5 divided by x to the power of 3? Well, 5 minus 3 gives us the 2, so we can say... I hope that that is sensible to you. We can also see one other thing, and it's an important rule. It comes out of these here. And the reason why I want to really emphasize this one is one aspect of it seems clear. We have found over here, we have found that x to the minus 1 gives us 1 over x to the plus 1. See? Plus 1. We found here that x to the minus 2 gives us 1 all over x to the plus 2. So we could easily come up with this rule. But that rule is a little, a little misleading because, and best ex explained by an example, let's look here. What about 1 over x to the minus 5? What about that? What do we do with that? Well, that won't get fully explained by this rule. But what is 1 over x to the minus 5? What does it mean? And let's even bring it down to its most basic. What does this mean? And now, what we'll do is we'll, our own selves, we'll hunt to find its meaning. Because while you're learning your maths for your junior cert, it's really important that you develop the practice of hunting for your own solutions for things because your mind will strengthen and then you'll be find it much much easier in your exams and you'll also set yourself up for the leave insert and then after that into college but let's hunt this let's find out what we're talking about here and what you will find again like most other things is that the toolbox you're going to use now you could have worked when you were in national school pick the simple one And we'll step by step through this. 1 over x to the minus 1. What is x to the minus 1 is the first question. Well, we know from here that it's 1 over x. True, which is 1 over x to the ordinary plus 1. Now we've got a national school problem. And the national school problem, we're going to write over on the right hand side, just again to give ourselves an idea of how the game plays out. Let's example. We'll go 1 divided by... Sorry, I'll rewrite that. 1 divided by, we'll say, 1 over 5. And we say, how do we simplify that? 
we've got a real problem here because instead of just a fraction with one single bar through it, we have a three-story one. One over a one over a five. And again, what you find is we solve this by multiplying this by one. Multiplying something by one doesn't change it. So we're confident that what we're going to do now will still leave us with the same final answer because we're only going to multiply it by one. So we'll do this in small steps. And I'm just emphasizing again to you that the small steps that I'm showing you aren't ones that you have to write down on the page every single time. No, they're just being shown to you so that your mind can see them and you move at whatever pace then suits you. But mostly, I'm showing these so that your mind can see the little individual steps so that it can relax to them and understand them and then can just skip quickly. Let's multiply it by 1. No, we haven't changed anything. You can multiply anything by 1 and not change it. But we haven't actually helped ourselves either. We are no near, you would think, to finding a solution. Well, the secret here is to now ask yourself one question. In my fraction, what's the thing that's causing me the problem? Well, we're well used to fractions like 2 over 3, 7 over 9. So the first two bits are okay. This bit must be the problem. The third bit, the bit down here. Haven't found our problem, we're now going to use a version of 1, which is the problem divided by itself. There is the problem divided by itself. We're doing the baby steps here. We're doing the baby steps for two reasons. One, the first time as you're discovering or learning something, it's really important to bring your mind down to baby steps. You may think this sounds silly or I hope nobody sees me do this. All those ideas are wrong. We have this odd belief that geniuses take these massive steps, you know, that we plod along in little steps and they bounce around like kangaroos. That's not the truth. If you look at the amazing work that Newton carried out, uh, Leibniz, or the truly outstanding French mathematicians. Like, now please, if you know French better than me, forgive me for my poor pronunciation, but like Lagrange, um, I will say, there's at least 12 of the truly important great mathematicians in the last three, four hundred years, 12 of the 20 we will say, are French. The Greeks were the great mathematicians of the old days. I would find it very hard to recognize a greater contribution to mathematics in the modern world than that which the French have given us. Okay? You've got, for example, Fourier. You can't hardly do anything in electronics without it involving Fourier. Um, Laplace. They are absolutely immense and deserve to be recognized for their great contribution. But what you find is every one of those, all the really great guys, took smaller steps than we take. They look in, mo in more little, small details, micro steps they look at. And then they'll see the things that we jumped over. So we're the ones that are the kangaroos bouncing around the place, jumping over the useful little bit of information. So. This may look like, and actually is, a micro little step examination of what we're doing. But hopefully, if you see it, and it then makes sense to you, then the game of how to solve a three-story problem like this should become obvious to you. Now, watch. Just keeping it all as we know it to be. So above the line, we're happy. We've 1 by 5 is 5. And below the line, what we have is 1 over 5 multiplied by 5. 
So five fifths of an apple. If you had five fifths of an apple, you have a full apple. So the answer is five over one, which is equal to five. Now, across here on our right hand side, we've given ourselves a problem that we weren't asked to solve. We've given ourselves this problem to come up with a map. And the map is to help us solve this problem because it's got X's and we go, oh God, what do we do with X's? So we go to the little numbers that we know well and we've been playing with real numbers, ones that we can say, yes, I know what five is, ones we've been using since national school, and we come up with a system. And what we have found is, as a more general rule to it, if we have A all over B divided by C, we have now found out that the problem here is this guy. So I can now multiply by 1 in the form... Oh, sorry, I want to get rid of something here because it'll confuse you otherwise. Right. I don't know where that minus came from. So now let's proceed again. We're going to multiply by C. Above and below the line. And we'll say that's equal to A by C all over B. So over here, we can now then say this is equal to 1 all over 1 over X multiplied by X over X, which is X. And that's X to the 1. Now we've found the second half to fill out this rule here. And the second half is, having started with a negative underneath the line, you finish up with a positive above the line. What we noticed up here was when you start off with positive underneath the line, you finish up with a negative above the line. So this game is, you change signs. That rule here is also exactly the same as saying x to the n, well we call it m this time, x to the m is 1 all over x to the minus m. So that's how it works. Now, having done this over here, I would say to you that there is a second way of visualizing how you get rid of a three-story fraction. And this method, I'll even show it to you with a four-story fraction. Okay? If we have 2 over 3 divided by 7 over 11, and you'd go, my goodness, what do I do with that? Well, watch that. That's a division. What we can do is, whatever is underneath the line, we, if we flip it, and flipping it means get its reciprocal, and now you need to know what a reciprocal is. If I have the number 7, its reciprocal is 1 over 7. A number multiplied by its reciprocal gives you 1. So 7 multiplied by 1 over 7 is 1. This here is equal to 2 over 3. Now we'll go multiplied Instead of divided, see it was divide here. We're going to multiply now. And 7 over 11, we're going to flip it. Okay? So, we've gotten rid of the four-story division and turned it into something much simpler. While this is the easiest one to think of right now, for the what we're dealing with. The previous one, which was in smaller steps, has its place and it's good to understand it because when you go into other proofs and move on up through your years, you will find that it's much easier to think that way or it's more rewarding. You get more out of it to think that way. So now we are making progress with these rules. There's another rule that's important. Let's look at this situation.
and we want to know what does that mean and we want to come up with a general rule but we're looking at one specific example what you do again is you take little micro steps because the micro steps tells you what's happening look at one thing at a time let's look at what's inside the bracket what was inside the bracket x squared well that is x by x isn't it and all of what was inside the bracket was cubed so we're saying the x by x is cubed so and that's six of them so we'd say it's x to the six so we're saying x squared cubed is x to the six so the rule the new rule is x to the m x to the power of m all of that brought to the power of n gives us what to give us x to the m by n because 6 is equal to 2 by 3 in our simple example over here they're the basic rules you need to know you will find that if you practice these and you get fast at using these the type of problems that you get for a, your honours exam next summer will be easily worked through. Lots of people have trouble with indices because they say there's just so many rules that have to be learnt off and then others will say oh all these rules are in the logbooks all we have to do is set the page open in the logbook. The trouble with either of those two things is they slow you down and you need to know these things by heart. They're part of the toolbox you're supposed to carry with you the same way as a plumber carries a toolbox knowing plumbing doesn't let you solve the problem unless you have the tools beside you we are exactly the same we must carry a toolbox and we must be as fast with those tools as a good plumber is with a plumber's tools there is no difference whatsoever we are talking about the trade of mathematics here rather than the art of mathematics which is the um, the either development of new mathematics or the solving of very interesting problems. This is the trade of our, this is our bread and butter. Okay. You need to know one little thing about this. Last one down here. Now, x to the m to the power of n is equal to x to the m n, which is equal to x to the n the power of m. Let's look at that. Well, we could say clearly it's x x x to the power of 5 and you're going to get 15 of these. Also, x to the power of 5 cubed is so what we know already from our ordinary well learnt maths is 3 by 5 is 15 which is the same as 5 by 3 because of that what we know is x cubed to the power of 5 must be the same as x power of 5 cubed. They're the same. That's why you need to know this. x to the m all to the power of n is the same as x to the n all to the power of m. x m n equals x n m. Having learnt all of this, here's something that throws people and actually most people I've taught even for leaving cert honours maths get caught by this very very simple thing everything we've done so far in relation to something like x to the m all to the power of n or x to the m divided by x to the n what you will notice about those is we're dealing with multiplying things or dividing things this is the one that catches people I'll give it by example x 
take that. 2 to the power of 7 minus 2 to the power of 6. How do you simplify that? Well, you simplify it by, in your mind, just understanding what things are. And we'll come over to the right-hand side. You'll notice I'm really drilling this right-hand side thing for you because I want you to get used to doing that so that in your exam, all your not-so-certain thinking gets done over here and all your good, clear mathematics you write down along here. What does the left-hand side mean? We know 2 to the 7 is... This is not a time to make a mistake. That's 2 to the 7 minus 2 to the 6, isn't it? All you need to recognise now is 6 of these 2's multiplied together. Aha! Uh -huh. There they are. So, again, we're taking the baby steps again. Let's look at that. It's 2 by... And now we can convert it. We know what this is. It's the same as that. Okay. So what we have is it's 2 multiplied by 2 to the 6 minus 2 to the 6. And in our good mathematical principle that we learnt the first day, it's always worthwhile renaming something. If something gets a little bit complicated, give it a simple name. Or if you don't know what something is, give it a name because now you can play with the name as though you know it and then you'll get an answer. This thing, you can give it a name. I can call it an apple for all I care. You can call it anything. This is probably High Impens National School stuff you're looking at now. Let's get silly about it. Two apples minus one apple is equal to one apple. So what did we call an apple? We called two to the six an apple. So what we have found is that two to the seven minus 2 to the 6 is equal to 2 by 2 to the 6 minus 2 to the 6 and 2 of these guys minus 1 of these guys is just 2 to the 6. We have actually applied one of our rules if you want to see it in a bit more detail. What we actually were saying is like 2 to the m plus n and in this case it was 2 to the 1 plus 6 because that's 7 and we say minus 2 to the n minus 2 to the 6 that's the general principle we've been using what we have found is we can split this up any power 2 to the power of 17 is 2 to the power of 10 multiplied by 2 to the power of 7 it's 2 to the power of 16 multiplied by 2 to the power of 1 and any other variation you like. The trick is, just pick the variation that makes your problem easy. If we now pick a second example to clear this point for you, and we'll say 3 to the power of 7. Might as well stick to it. But this time we'll go 3 to the minus to the power of 5. What we are doing is we'll look at this guy and compare it to this guy. 7 is 2 plus 5. And we'll do it the long way for you. And we'll come over here now. I'm only doing that because I've run out of space down below. Your page is longer, so you keep going down. You don't run across the page, you go down um, when you're answering your questions. But I'm just trying to not have to blink out this page and be able to work on um, and show you it all in the one thing. So we're now continuing down, but I'm showing it across here. 
So we're saying, hmm, 3 squared, well, that is 9 by 3 to the 5. Minus 3 to the 5. Again, I can call that anything. 9 items minus one of those items is 8 items. So, this thing is equal to that. 3 to the 7 minus 3 to the 6 is, or 3 to the 5 is 8 by 3 to the 5. That's the one little aspect of dealing with indices that I generally find that people are not clear on. Okay? We have a last little bit to deal with on, on these before we get into the kind of questions that you would expect to have for the leaving cert. Or sorry for the junior cert <coughs> and that's dealing with um, square roots cube roots and stuff like that and we will approach it as mathematicians rather than my teaching you how to do it I'm hoping that you will see how very very simple the reasoning system is that allows you step by step use information you know or simple methods that you know to solve something that you may not know and even if you know the answer to this already, which I'm sure many of you do, just follow the process, okay? What we want, we're looking for is, let's say, the square root of x. We're saying, okay, I know what the square root of x is. But what's it? x equal to what power? How do I write it, the square root of x, in this shape? What power would I use? First thing is, if you don't know what something is, you name it. So we'll give it a name. We'll say, well, it's x to the power of a, whatever a is. We're using a so that we can keep it, we can avoid using question marks. Now then, this is where something like the Avatar film would help you here. You may well be sitting in one room, but your avatar can be moving around elsewhere. This, we know how to use and manipulate that, and we'll use this like a little avatar to imitate what it's doing. What's the relationship between root x and x, which is x to the 1? We know that the square root of x, when it's multiplied by itself, will actually give us x. Like the square root of 4, which is 2. 2 by 2 is 4. The square root of 9 is 3. 3 by 3 is 9. Therefore, the square root of 9 multiplied by the square root of 9 is 9. The square root of any number multiplied by the square root of the same number is equal to the number which we know is x to the 1. Now, let's look at the av avatar playing the same little game. x to the a, that's what we're calling the square root of x in the x to the index game x to the a multiplied by x to the a we're just copying what we've done over here is equal to x which is x to the 1 now we know about our rules x to the m multiplied by x to the n is x to the n plus m so that's x to the a plus a and we know that's x to the 2a and it's equal to from here it's x to the 1 how can x to the 2a equal x to the 1 it's only possible if 2a equals 1 which implies a equals a half so we can now solve our problem the square root of x is equal to x to the half. We can do the same thing for any other root. If you look at the cube root, the cube root of x is x to the what? We will this time call it x to the b. Just it's a name. 
and I don't want to use the same q's a again because we're going to get a different answer out of this. What do we know? The cube root of x multiplied by the cube root of x multiplied by the cube root of x is equal to x. 27. The cube root of 27. That's the number multiplying by itself and again by itself that will give us 27. We know it's 3. 3 by 3 is 9 and 9 threes are 27. So, yes, that is the game. Let's play with the avatar again. x to the b by x to the b by x to the b equals x to the 1. That implies x to the 3 of these b's equals x to the 1. The only way that's possible is it implies 3b equals 1. So, b equals 1 over 3. x to the b is x to the 1 over 3. So then, the cube root of x is x to the 1 over 3. Now, we need to just see a few little things that are kind of interesting and you generally don't get to see in the books. Watch this. What's that equal to? Well, it's actually equal to root 2 also. Look at it. And example, another example we'll say. Kind of sorry now I didn't use root 5 under 3, 4, 5. It's kind of a curious little thing, but it's all very sensible, and you have more than enough mathematics to make sense of this. We will pick the middle one, just to show the principle. What have we got? We have something, plus itself, plus itself. So we have three of these somethings. So we're saying, hmm. That's that. Now it's very clear. We can say that implies 3 over root 3. And we know what 3 is, don't we? Isn't it root 3 by root 3? And we have it over root 3. So what we've written here is exactly the same as this, only we've expanded 3 to being root 3 by root 3, because root 3 by root 3 is 3. Here's the nice thing. That cancels that. So we get it's equal to root 3. Down here, we have 7 of these 1 over root 7s. So 7 by 1 over root 7 is equal to 7 over root 7, which is root 7 by root 7 over root 7, which is that guy cancels that guy. And we are left with root 7. So these surprising little results, these type of things, you can find with very simple little micro steps that they actually make total sense to you and all you're doing is you're applying the same little rules that you've learnt um, three or four pages back. Just to clarify one point before we move on to the little problems that are associated with this thing, I just want to make certain that you are clear on the <coughs> on this particular one. a to the minus n is equal to 1 over a to the n. Also, a to the m equals 1 over a to the minus m. 
what we're saying is to bring something from beneath the line to bring it above the line like like it's over here what you do is you change the sign of the power in this case the minus becomes a plus in this case over here it changes to a minus examples three to the minus five equals one over three to the five and we will go five to the seven is equal to one over five to the minus seven I know people doing honors leaving certain maths and if you gave them that and asked them to simplify it they would have a lot of difficulty because they only seem to know the rule this way it's important to remember the rule that way it's one of the little things that seriously catch people out at this stage we have most of the type of things done that you will be asked so it's kind of useful to get into the problems then that we're supposed to solve there are some very obvious ones and these are the examples given in the book as I've mentioned to you that I'm using at the moment the example 4 to the x equals 16 how do you solve that? the trick is to find a common base and we will look at what we mean by that a to the power of b equals c this thing here the thing that's been brought to a power is the base this thing here is the index and that's the answer over here we need a common base now the first thing we look at is we look at the base that's over here and we will try out that base and see if we can get 16 expressed in terms of that base and because this is example 1 it's going to be the easiest example because they're giving you the principle of how to do it please do not make the mistake of rushing through simple examples because you think god they're so simple they're ridiculous the truth is the example is simple so that you can clearly see the principle that is being um, put forward here we know that 16 is equal to 4 squared so what we can say now is then 4 to the x is 4 squared how is that possible how can 4 to the x be equal to 4 squared it can only be true if that is equal to that <clears throat> let's look at his second example and you can be forgiven for thinking that it's getting way more complicated it isn't you're just going to be applying the same rules that we've discussed <coughs> now again at this point in time we have one base this one now we have a number over here underneath the line <coughs> and we want to see can we easily bring it to that base to some power 9 to what power will give us 27 mm. you'll go into numbers that won't be too easy for you so we will now look at this guy over here and find a sub base something smaller than that 9 is something to some power you'll go aha it's 3 squared so you can say that implies 3 squared all to the power of 2x minus 3 and I'm going to bracket this up here just in case and we're going I'm now looking at this new base 3 and I happen to know that 27 is 3 cubed remember the rule we have and by the way that's 3 to the plus 3 we know I can bring this thing 
above that line by changing the sign of that power. Look at this side over here. I have the x to the n to the power of m situation, which is x to the n m. So we'll say 3 to the power of 2 multiplying into 2x minus 3. And that's equal to 3 to the minus 3. How is it possible? How can we have this expression equal to this one? The only way we can have it is if the index here is the same as the index here. So even though we have started out dealing with a base to a power, a base to a power, and playing like that, we find now that we've brought ourselves to a situation where the only thing we have to look at is the power or the index. The reason for it is we have actually got the exact same base everywhere. So there's no more to look at in that. We're now only going to look up at the index level or the power level. And you can now solve for your x. There's a little uh, story that probably will help you. Um, we're going to be mainly dealing with the thirds, which are square root things. <coughs> we are now going to introduce two names, for a name for each of two different types of uh, number. We're going to talk about rational numbers and irrational numbers. They're very, very, it's very strange that we should even use a term like some number is rational. And that another one is irrational. I know it's irrational that I can't spell, but that's what word is for. It corrects all your spellings. And I think it's right. I think there's two R's in there. So how can we say a number is irrational? Because rational means it's sensible. So does it make sense to use numbers that we call not sensible, as in irrational? The history behind this goes all the way back to the old Greeks. And it goes back to Pythagoras, you know, the guy with the right angle triangle. He actually started a cult that ran for almost a thousand years. And even 100, 150 years AD, there were more people in the Pythagorean cult than there were in Christianity at that stage. It was a major phenomenon in its time. Why did he start a cult? It's very interesting. The Greeks actually only had two types of numbers. They had whole numbers, which were considered to be perfect, like one, two, three. Okay? Even the term we use for them now gives you an indication as to how much we like these numbers. Then the second type of number they had was anything that could be expressed as a fraction of one whole number divided by another one. 2.5, in other words, 2.5. While it isn't a whole number, it's still not all that bad because we can call it 5 over 2, which is a whole number divided by a whole number. So it's a perfect full number divided by another perfect full number. That was grand. The Greeks, particularly Pythagoras and his people, believed that everything in the world, or what we might call the universe, could be expressed in terms of numbers, that mathematics was supreme. It ha had quite a religious significance to him. And each of the whole numbers were given a significance. Number one meant something such as wholeness or perfection. Number two had a certain meaning, number three had a meaning. Number four stood for justice, four. If you think about four, like that, a square has four sides. 
Today, we still use the term, and my understanding, based on what I've read, is that when we say a square deal, that that is an inheritor from the Pythagorean concept that four stood for justice. So there's lots of things that would surprise you that relates back to him. So why do we have a problem here? Well, Pythagoras found it extremely embarrassing when they not only when they were able to estimate the diagonal of the perfect square and a square was one of the perfect shapes you know and we we'll say if in square we just say unit square which is one by one and one by one is an area of one but the problem is they found that the diagonal of the perfect square could not be expressed as a number is what he said now you have to understand he thought in terms of just two types of numbers whole full numbers or perfect numbers and other numbers that could be redeemed because they could be expressed as a whole number divided by another whole number they were rational numbers because they could be expressed in terms of two whole numbers he found that this thing couldn't be and he made a terrible mistake and that mistake not only lasted the thousand years till the end of his cult but it literally lasted up to about the 13 1400s and you could argue it lasted into the 16 1700s he denied that as a number what he should have done is recognized that he had discovered a third type of number a number that could not be expressed as a whole number divided by whole number and today we call those numbers that can't be expressed by a whole number divided by whole number we call them irrational in other words not sensible so these names very much relate back to the old Greeks and the concept that ran from half a, well, half a thousand years before um, BC for about two thousand years two millennia we have been burdened with <laughs> what he did he denied this now there's an interesting aspect to it like what we know now is oh that is root two and it's irrational because it cannot be expressed as a fraction it's an infinitely um, long non-repeating number and we can't talk about 1.414 blah 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 which you'll get exhausted long before you'll even make a dent in how long it goes because it goes on forever he set up his cult to hide this terrible embarrassment that even the diagonal of the perfect square couldn't be expressed as a number one of the two number type numbers that the Greeks had now as you moved up in his cult you got introduced to more and more of the secrets of the cult but way up at the top was that even the diagonal of the unit square couldn't be expressed as a number and you had to swear under penalty of death this is not a joke by the way you had to swear under penalty, penalty of death that you would not um, divulge this very embarrassing secret well people are people and a guy called Hippasus um, he actually let the secret out and they did kill him so <laughs> even these names and the concept of irrational numbers uh, they had a very um, worrisome and bloody start and it took seriously good mathematicians in only the last few hundred years to redeem the um, character of these numbers so these are the ones we're dealing with now in mathematics we generally don't like to have something like 1 over the square root of n we don't like things like that we dislike having thirds underneath the line. What we want to do is we want to finish up in any answer we want to get something let's say like 3 root 2. You don't want to finish up with let's say 7 over root 5. You don't want something like that. You want something that looks like this. How do we deal with it? Well we multiply by 1. What's our problem here? Our problem is this guy the root n is below the line so we're going to use one in the form of root n over root n 
So we'll say yes, write down what I had, and now 1, which is something divided by itself, is going to be root n over root n. And we now multiply. 1 by root n gives us root n, and root n by root n gives us n. We are much, much happier seeing this than that. We don't like that. And that's the game we're going to play. An example from the book. An easy example, obviously, to begin with. You're saying, oh, really, I need to get rid of this from down here. And we're looking for something in relation to a 5 up top. 3 by 5 is 15. Now, secretly, we do know that 5 is root 5 by root 5. And one of them will cancel down below. So we can do it out the long way for you if you want. And see them cancel. So the answer is 3 root 5. That's not difficult. The reason it's not difficult is we haven't done anything here that you don't know already. It's how you simplify a multi-layered fraction, a 3 or a 4 story high fraction. Same game, multiplied by 1. 1 in the form of, in there, multiplying by 1. It's in the form of the problem divided by the problem. This guy was the problem. On page 187, Question 10. The writers of this book are being very smart here, and I mean smart for your benefit, okay? They're being very smart here because they're giving you problems that give you the opportunity of opening your eyes and seeing what's there, and if you can see what's there like this, you can solve them, and otherwise you got a long trudge of a problem. And if you have a long trudge of a problem, you know in the exam you're wasting time. Your, your whole thing is, look, see what's there. The Department of Education and those who write the questions that you're supposed to solve, they are looking to find thinkers, not sluggers. Your job is to look, simply see what's there, Ask yourself, is this similar to something I know? And if it is, you will find the shortcut that they wish you to find. So here's a load of them, and they're all the same shortcut, but it's important to see it. It's something we discussed before, and we will bring it back again now, because it's very important. We can pick on any of these. Okay. If you rush into that, you will start multiplying first by first, first by second, second by first, second by second. You don't need to do that. Your job before you ever rush into maths is look at it. Now clearly, we have a bracket multiplied by a bracket. But inside the brackets, see this guy. You know, and you can see, visually see, it's repeated here. We also have this guy, and he's repeated here. The difference is there's a minus there and a plus there. So what are we looking at? You should remember, because I laid a lot of emphasis on this, if we had x plus y by x minus y, the answer was the difference of two squares. Okay? Whatever you do, learn this thing off by heart. But more importantly, learn to look for it. Here we are dealing with something that has surds in it, but it's been constructed to give you a shortcut cut that stops you doing a lot of multiplication. The 5, that's operating like this x over here. The root 3 is going to operate like the y. 
we know that the answer will be the square of the first one minus the square of the second one. There you go. You didn't even need to I was going to put a mark on it, but I will now. You didn't even need to write that line. You could have gone straight from this to this line. By the way, just so that you know the name of it, this guy here and this guy here, they're called conjugate pair. And this is clearly the difference of two squares. Look at your mathematics, look at what's been asked. And one of the tools that you have in your toolbox is the difference of two squares, the conjugate pair, which are the factors of the difference of two squares. Here, no x's, no y's. We have thirds, like a root three here, but it's all we're looking at is the difference of two squares. These are the factors, they're the conjugate pair belonging to it. Pick any of the other examples in here. <coughs> And there's a whole load of them in here. We'll pick this one, which is the that one. Root seven minus four. Well, it's going to be root seven squared, which is seven, minus four squared, which is sixteen. And that'll give you your answer. See how fast it is? When you open your eyes, look at the thing and ask yourself, does this remind me of something? What you're looking for is something that is similar to one of the things I've done before that I'm very familiar with. And the department are extremely good at placing a lot of these things into the exam. And when you see them, you don't need all the time that the, the exam uh, gives you. You'll be finished long before the exam's finished. You can get every question in the paper finished inside the exam time if you see what they've given to you, all the cute little ways of simplifying. Because remember, I've mentioned that what we will do is explain everything to you. When we explain everything to you, you can say that you understand everything. And I've mentioned to you that that's not the same as you knowing everything. Understanding takes time. It's slow. When you understand that stuff, you go through that system. If you've practiced with the exercises, you, through practice, turn understanding into knowing. And you say, I know that. The characteristic how you know that you know something is you can just look and understand it. Okay. What's 7 plus 4? I'm very much of the opinion that you didn't need to count with your fingers. And if you didn't, you should know 7 and 4 is 11. It's so fast in your mind that there might be a little thinking, but the likelihood is there's none. Especially if you've done your tables well in national school. This is something you can literally pull out of your stored memory. When you look at these things, you should be able to pull out of your stored memory what the thing looks like. And then you hop straight down onto this line. And you're guaranteed, right? You don't make a mistake with intervening steps because you've got almost no mathematics here. Because you've got recognition. And you play on that. We're actually quite close to the end of this now, believe it or not. A little note that you need to understand. Um, when we do something like this, when we talk about the square root of 64,
you can come over here and say 64. What number multiplied by 64? Or sorry, what number multiplied by itself will give me 64? Now over here, we do know that there's actually two different answers to this. 8, that's a plus 8, multiplied by a plus 8 is equal to 64. True? And we also know minus 8 multiplied by minus 8 is equal to 64. So then, when we're trying to get an answer to this, do we have a problem? Is it that we're saying it's plus 8 or minus 8? And the truth is, it's not this one. That's why it's important for you to recognize it. And the easy way out of this is come over here and look at these again. And we say, hmm, plus 8. That's like plus root 64. Multiplying into plus, see the plus there, root 64. Whereas this line is minus root 64 minus root 64. The way I deal with this is I always consider that the sign is outside the root. See? And you do know that when we don't show a sign, such as here, it's always a plus. So, in any case, i.e., plus 3, not minus 3, simply because that's a plus, is my way of looking at it. Um, <coughs> what else do we need to show you? Okay, equations involving thirds. These are actually easy. There's only one trick in them. And we'll see that trick now. Let's look at the example given in the book. 2 plus the square root of 4x minus 3 equals x. And this is under the heading of equations involving thirds. Thirds being things like with square roots in them. We're trying to find a value for x. Our problem is, yes, we have a nice handy x out here, but this guy is trapped in underneath a square root sign. What's the trick? The trick is the third you keep it on one side and move everything else to the other side. That implies we've now just pulled this two over to this side here so that's why it's a negative. Now we're only one step away from getting into terribly easy mathematics. If the square root of a number is equal to that, well then, I can square both sides, and I'll even name it for you. And we look at an example, and this is being deliberately stupid, okay? If I say to you that 5 equals 10 over 2, Okay. Square both sides. Which implies 25 equals 100 over 4. And that's also true. See? Once that is equal to that, squaring this is equal to the square of that. So now we have started with the square root. And now we're going to say square both sides. So the square of square root, yes, it's important for you to understand this. If I get the square root of x and square it, it's equal to x. And if you wonder why, well, that's x to the half squared, which is equal to x to 2 by a half, which is equal to x to the 1. So it's just x. Square both sides. 4 x minus 3 is going to be equal to the square of this x minus 2 and we can multiply this out 
and now we have an easy equation. And you can see we're down into a little quadratic problem. When we solve that, <coughs> Remember, we've said before, the only way that you can get zero from multiplying one number by another number is one of those numbers at least has to be zero. We don't know which one, so it could be one or the other. That's why what we write now is that implies that x minus 7 is equal to zero or the other one, x minus 1 equals zero. That implies x equals 7 or x equals 1. At this stage, yes, you've got your answers. You've got the answers, but let's confirm. Confirm. Confirm the results. And how you do that is, in turn, you put, for example, 7 in here, and you put 7 here. And you check that it's true. And then, having done that, you put one in here and one over here and you check that one, just to be sure. We've almost got to the end of what we're going, what we're talking about here. The last little thing, we might as well just add it on here because it's in the same uh, chapter, is the issue of scientific notation. And scientific notation is where you can have a number such as 5,300. That's an manageable number. But in science and mathematics and uh, lots of other areas, you can finish up with numbers that are so huge that they're hard to handle, or so, so terribly small they're also hard to handle and very hard to write. Because if I had 0, 0.000 with 79 zeros, 127, you'd be a very long time writing that. And what have you had to write in the next line, and the next line, and the next line? So we want to have something to make our life easy. Mathematicians are absolutely brilliant at finding ways of making things easy. We want to get this. We want one number, just one of them, in front of a decimal point, and then a certain number of points after, and in this case I'm just showing three. They may say, and three decimal points, or they might look for two, or may look for more, or they'll say to you, do you notice how if, if we fill out this and we look at this, and we'll just say, 1.732. You can see, yes, there's three decimal points here, numbers after the decimal point, but there's actually four significant figures. Because you've got that one and those three. And what we're going to do is multiply it by 10 to some number. Look at this number here. Isn't that 530 multiplied by 10? Which is 53 multiplied by 10 by 10. I'm being deliberately long here, so as you can see the principle. And still, we have 53. That's still too big. We only want one number in front of the decimal point. So we can now just change how we're writing and say it's 5.3 multiplied by 10, which is to the 1, multiplied by 10 squared. And we know that's 5.3 multiplied by 10 cubed. 
Watch what's happened. The decimal point is here at the moment. There's four figures in front of it. The decimal point is here now, and there's three figures in front of it. And I've got a plus one here. I'll rewrite that. Ten to the power plus one. Down here, the decimal point is there. And I have plus two here. What we're doing is every time, and we'll show it now down here, five, three, naught, naught, decimal point, just shown for good keeping, is equal to 5.3 multiplied by 10 to the plus 3. You don't have to write the plus, but there's no harm. Watch. If you hop to the left, every time you hop to the left, this goes up a plus. It goes up a plus 1. So we've made three hops for the decimal point. We've hopped it that way, so watch it. The decimal point has moved all the way to here. That's 3 to the left, so we've 10 to the plus 3. Also, look at this. 0 0.0000279. We want to turn it into something that looks like that. I can multiply this by 10. I can multiply it by 10 again. I can multiply it by 10 again. But every time I multiply it by 10, I'm making it 10 bigger. And we can't do that. But we can do this. Right? Multiply it by 10 and divide by 10 at the same time, which is multiplying by 1, which is the point we were dealing with earlier. So look at this. That's equal to 2.7. Nine. Now, having made it 2.79, we have made it 10 times bigger, 100 times bigger, 1,000 times bigger, 10,000 times bigger, 100,000 times bigger. This number is from that number. So if I've made it 100,000 times bigger, I will also have to divide it by 100,000. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we can say that's equal to 2.79 multiplied by 1 over, sorry, 10 to the 5, which is 2.79 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5. So every time we move the decimal point, one step to the right, in this case, one jump, two jumps, three jumps, four jumps, five jumps, to produce this number with the decimal point here, we now have to multiply by 10 to the minus 5. So the 10 drops a power if you move to the right. The same way as up here, 10 gains a power it gains, it goes up a plus every time you move to the left. And the problems are very, very straightforward. We finish with the one example on this. Do you remember before we learnt that when we have something like minus 3x multiplying into minus 5xy, lots of bits there, there are signs, there are coefficients which are constants of the numbers, and there are variables, the x's and y's. You don't try and eat all that in one bite. You start with your signs, then you deal with your 
constants, your numbers, and then you deal with your variables. So the signs were minus by minus, and you get a plus, and you can immediately just write on plus. Now you don't have to worry about your signs. Then you're saying 3 by 5 is 15, and you go, excellent, that's the number bit, it's plus 15. And now it's x by xy, so it's x squared y, and the answer is plus 15 x squared y. You do it bit by bit. It's the same with these things. What are the different types of bits here? That's an ordinary number. That's an ordinary number. That's an ordinary number. That's a 10 to the power, a 10 to the power, and a 10 to the power. So you do them in those two separate bits. And I'll show it by just keeping life easy and simple for myself. There are the number of bits. And they're going to multiply into Obviously you can use a calculator on this, but you don't need to use a calculator on that if you just look at the numbers. But we will follow and say that that's the easy bit and we'll just call it 15. And we say multiply by. Now, our only little issue here is we need to bring this above the line because what we actually have here, let's look at it over here on the right. Oops, I need more space than that. Don't be stupid about it. Let's look at it over here. Remember, you may have a big equation and you may have a problem in a bit of it. You bring the bit to the right hand side. And we look at it over here. 10 to the plus 3 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4 divided by 10 to the minus 2. And the bit that's giving us a little bit of a problem is that bit. So let's very carefully step down through this. This bit's OK. And it's being, all that is being multiplied by, remember you can multiply anything by 1, over 10 to the minus 2. Yeah. We know how to bring that up above the line. We do it by changing that sign. So we're saying, it's equal to 10 to the plus 3 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4 multiplied by 10 to the change the sign to plus 2. And now we've got, and do you notice how when we're de dealing with scientific notation, we generally finish up dealing with indices. Three and two is five minus four is one. And life should be relatively easy, or do you think so? Come on. Is all this fine? Because it's your job to check your number, okay? Has there has everything here being played out correctly. What is it that they're going to ask for here? One of two things. First off, and the most important thing now at this stage, having gone through each of your little steps, is look at what we've got as an answer. This answer isn't in ordinary notation, and it isn't scientific notation. The last thing you have to confirm with these kind of questions is, what type of notation are you asked to give your answer in? If they say, express your answer in scientific notation, we now are left with one problem of moving the decimal point from here to here. And then you'd have 1.5 multiplied by 10 to the 2. If we were asked to express our number in ordinary or standard form, we will just multiply this by 10 and we'll get 150. The decision between this and this depends on what they ask you. Getting down to here, yes, that is the right answer. The answer is 15 by 10. 
but it may not be the form they've asked for it in. We have put a little over an hour into looking at indices and certs, and certs really are just a, f a specialist form of indi indices. Scientific notation is just a cute way of utilising indices to keep very unmanageable numbers into a small space so that you can look at them and consider them in relation to other numbers. The problems that come up in relation to these are very, very straightforward. If you really understand the rules, and if you don't understand the rules, you're looking at as close to a zero mark from this little bit, this part of the question, as you're possibly able to get. I would say in most other sections you can make some sort of a decent attempt, but if you don't know the rules here in relation to indices and simplifying things, you'll probably get zero on it. Whereas if you just learn off the rules and practice them to turn, the, turn from understanding into knowing, if you do that, you'll get all the marks. And that's really worthwhile because the nice thing about this is there's no surprises. Know the rules, it's very easy. If you don't know the rules, you've just about got nothing. It's that straightforward and that's why it's worthwhile to learn them off and practice them and say, I know this stuff. You may think that it's only a part, this part of a question, that this, the knowledge on indices um, comes up. It, that's totally untrue. It comes up in so many other places, a fair amount in the junior cert and in the leaving cert, it riddles itself all the way through. Even in the special question, in section B, the special question in relation to differential calculus and series, understanding of indices comes up. Learn it now and make your future much, much easier. OK, we'll leave it at that. What I want to do the next day is to show you that already, at this point in time, you're able to answer four questions of paper one. Now, you only have six questions to do and six in the one afterwards in the second paper. So you were able to answer two-thirds of what you need in paper one, which is a whole third of the entire um, junior cert exam. Now, that should give you confidence, because we've only got about four. This is, I think, the fifth talk. And in five talks, you should have the understanding to be well able to do four questions in paper one. And we may spend two of these talks, two of these modules, going through past questions. Certainly the next one we're going to be going through uh, past questions on those four sections and possibly the second module we'll do that. And then what we'll do is we will look at graphing because graphing will give you a fifth question in paper one. You are very very close to being able to have your whole six questions for paper one and hey it's not even mid-November yet. Okay um, Goodbye from Engineers Ireland and I look forward to chatting to you the next day. Good luck now.